is a highly specialized part of a plant. Inside are the reproductive organs, the male and the female parts of the plant. The male parts are called stamens and they surround the pistil which is the female part of the plant. At the top of each stamen is the anther. Anthers contain pollen. At the top of the pistil is the stigma. Below the style and ovary. Inside the ovary are ovules which contain the egg cells. When the anthers are fully developed, they break open and shower their sticky grains of pollen onto the stigma. This is called self-pollination and in this special film you can see it actually happening. In self-pollinating flowers, the amount of pollen produced is small. Each pollen grain has a good chance of reaching the stigma and very little is wasted. In the laboratory, we can carry out a test which will show you what happens when the pollen grains land on the stigma. Pollen from a fully developed anther is added to a special sugar solution. Using a microscope and special film, we can see how tubes grow out from each pollen grain. This is exactly what happens when the pollen grains land on the stigma. The pollen tubes grow down the style to the ovules in the ovary and fertilization of the egg cells can take place. But self-pollination is not the only way in which fertilization in plants is brought about. Insects are attracted to plants by the bright colors, the perfumes, the nectar food, and the shapes and the patterns of the flowers. any one day, an insect usually visits only one type of flower. As an insect searches out nectar, it also collects grains of pollen. This is a diagram of a bee's leg. The tiny hairs trap the pollen grains, which are carried to the stigmas of other flowers. This is called cross-pollination. Some flowers, like an orchid, have special ways which make sure that bees and other insects carry away their pollen. When an insect lands on the petal, the anthers shoot out their pollen. This is a diagram of a meadow sage flower. When an insect goes in looking for nectar, it presses against the lever and the anther deposits its pollen on the back of the bee. Plants that rely on cross-pollination by insects produce much more pollen than flowers that are self-pollinated. A lot of the pollen gets lost on the way between one flower and the next. These are pine cones. On the left, the female cones, which contain the egg cells. On the right, the male cones, which produce the pollen. Pine cones are not brilliantly colored or patterned, and insects are not attracted to them as they are to flowers. On the underside of each male cone leaf is a pollen sac containing thousands of tiny winged pollen grains. The grains of pollen are winged because they're carried not by insects but by the wind. 
Plants that rely on wind pollination produce an enormous amount of pollen. Most of it is wasted and only a few grains fall into the female cones. The female cone, its leaves open to receive the pollen, has an ovule on the upper side of each cone leaf. Each ovule contains an egg cell ready to be fertilized by one of the pollen grains which falls onto the cone. After pollination, the cone leaves are drawn together, closing the cone, and inside, fertilization takes place. The pollen grains push out their tubes, and the male cell, called the sperm, moves down the tube and fertilizes the egg cell. In each ovule, one sperm fertilizes one egg cell. After fertilization, the fertilized egg cell grows and develops into a seed. This takes more than a year. The pine seed is made up of a seed coat on the outside and inside the food store that the embryo needs when it begins to grow into a new plant. Every year, plants produce hundreds of seeds which by various means are spread over a wide area. The fruits of the lime tree carry the seeds along on the breeze. The magnolia produces shining scarlet seeds. They hang for a time on threads and then either drop to the ground or are eaten by the birds. Birds eat many fruits and berries and so help to spread seeds over wide areas. Some fruits have spikes that may catch in the fur of animals or in clothing. This is a highly specialized seed of a British plant called the common stalks bill. The seed falls and lies still until the first rains. The tail of the seed, which is coiled like a spring, swells with water and begins to unwind, screwing the seed into the ground. This is a cress seed. With special film, we can watch what happens when it germinates. In the autumn of the second year, the pine cones open. Some of the seeds fall out and others are blown away. The following spring, if conditions are right, the seeds will germinate. But there is not sufficient food or space for all young plants to survive. But those that do continue to grow in some cases for hundreds of years. This is a sea urchin. In the breeding season, thousands of eggs from the female parts are released into the sea. The eggs float about waiting for their chance to be fertilized. Millions of sperm from the male parts of the sea urchin 
are also released into the sea, but not all of them will meet a female egg. Those sperm that do meet eggs quickly surround them and one sperm fertilizes each egg. This is a very inefficient method of fertilization and of the fertilized eggs, only one or two will survive to the adult stage. These trout are about to mate. The female loosens the gravel on the riverbed to make a saucer-shaped hollow. This helps to prevent the eggs being swept away by the current. The male settles down beside the female and tickles her with his tail. This stimulates the female to lay her eggs. About 200 or so are produced and immediately the male covers the eggs with a cloud of sperm or milt. This is a much more efficient method than that of the sea urchin and most of the eggs are fertilized. After mating, the female covers the eggs with gravel and that's the last time she sees them. In the gravel, the eggs develop. Some of them hatch out in the spring, but many are eaten by eels and other fish. The young trout have a large yolk sac, which is a sort of food store. They live off this food in the yolk until they're able to catch their own food. The young fish are now called fry. This is a female frog. The frog is an amphibian. It spends part of the time on land and part in the water. Mating always takes place in the water. The smaller male frog holds firmly onto the female by his front legs. Everywhere she goes until her eggs are laid, she carries him with her. Frogs return to the water because a watery medium is essential for efficient fertilization. As the eggs float in the water, the sperm are able to swim to and surround all the eggs and most of them are fertilized. The fertilized eggs are left to develop on their own, but many don't survive. Of the tadpoles that do hatch out, many are eaten by hungry predators and only one or two develop and grow to the adult stage. The kingfisher, like all land-based animals, has a problem. For fertilization to take place, the egg cells and sperm need a watery medium. The problem is overcome by a method of internal fertilization. But first, catch your fish. In the mating season, the male kingfisher courts the female by giving her a fish. When she's swallowed the fish, they mate. The male perches on the back of the female and wraps his tail under her tail until the reproductive openings, called cloacas, are together. The next day, the female lays her first egg. The birds court and mate every day for five days and the female lays five eggs. Let's see what happens. This is a diagram of the sex organs. The male has two testes. You can see only one in the diagram. And inside each testis, millions of sperm are produced. During mating, the sperm pass from the testes in a watery fluid through the joined cloacas and into the female. The male then flies off and inside the female, the sperm pass up the tube called an oviduct. At the top, an egg cell with its yolk is released from the ovary into the oviduct where it meets and is surrounded by the sperm swimming in their watery fluid. One sperm fertilizes the egg cell and together with the yolk, it is squeezed down the oviduct. In the special gland at the bottom of the oviduct, the shell is formed. It's possible for the kingfisher to waste his sperm if the cloacas are not properly together, and this could mean that the eggs were not fertilized. Mammals, of which man is a good example, have a more efficient way of passing sperm from the male to the female. A man, like all male mammals, has a penis, 
His sperm are produced in two testes, which hang in a bag of skin outside the body. The female has a tube called the vagina, which leads to a pear-shaped organ called the uterus. The uterus has two tubes, which lead to the ovaries, where the egg cells are produced. With the female lying down during mating, the penis becomes stiff and swollen with blood before being inserted into the vagina. Sperm from the testes pass along in a fluid through the penis into the vagina. The penis is then withdrawn. The sperm now pass into the uterus and along the tubes where, if they meet an egg cell, fertilization may take place. This is human sperm magnified thousands of times. 200 sperm laid head to tail would be only one centimeter long. This is a human egg cell surrounded by sperm. Mammals have a very efficient method of transferring sperm and the chances of fertilization when an egg is produced are very high. Only one sperm fertilizes the egg cell. A woman usually produces only one egg cell at a time, which after fertilization grows into an embryo inside the uterus. After nine months, a baby is born, which, unlike many other newborn animals, has every chance to develop into an adult. The reproductive cycle in animals and plants depends upon fertilization, and some methods are more efficient than others. But all provide for sufficient fertilized egg cells to ensure that some grow to maturity, and the species survive. Thank you.